So good evening and welcome to the Neighborhood Services District 1 Community Meeting. My name is Jason Perez, your Neighborhood Services Coordinator for District 1. Neighborhood Services serves as a single point of contact for residents in need of assistance. Do you have questions, ideas, or concerns regarding your neighborhoods? We at Neighborhood Services can help. Neighborhood Services facilitates a citywide effort to improve the livability of Anaheim neighborhoods by helping to create partnerships between city and community-wide resources. District community meetings are a part of the Anaheim Neighborhood, Neighborhood Improvement Program to improve those neighborhoods through a coordinated interdepartmental approach. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions at the end of the meeting. There are many resources and flyers in the back of the room here, and we encourage you to also pick up those, that information and share with neighbors as you go home tonight. Please note that the City of Anaheim is also in partnership with various community organizations that will be hosting the Anaheim Health Fair on November 6th and 7th at the Anaheim Community Center, Convention Center. The event will provide residents with a variety of free health services upon registration, so flyers are available at the resource table in the rear. If you've not done so already, please make sure to provide your contact information on our sign-in sheet so we can help keep you posted on city updates. Please remember to obtain a ticket from our goodie bag opportunity prize this evening, courtesy of Anaheim Public Utilities. Let's begin our meeting by inviting city staff to the front of the room to introduce themselves. City staff. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sandy Lozo. I'm the Community Preservation and Licensing Manager and also the Homeless Liaison for the City of Anaheim. Good evening, everyone. My name is Teresa Bass, City Clerk for the City of Anaheim. Good evening. I'm Susan Kim. I'm a Principal Planner with our Planning and Building Department. Hello. My name is Edina Good, and I'm with the Public Works Department. Good evening. Andrew Marcus, Anaheim Public Utilities. Hi, Anaheim Sporn, Community Services Manager. Hello, Jennifer Hall, the Assistant City Clerk. Good evening, Carlos Riquiza with Neighborhood Services. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, your city staff. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce District 1 Council Member Jose Diaz. He will be here for the duration of the meeting and available after the meeting for any questions you may have. Council Member Diaz, welcome. Thank you for being here and welcome. This is not my meeting, this is your meeting. Um, I'm impressed with how many services the city offers. So it's for, it's for me to listen, just, what, just like you. We got a lot of good information for us. I just want to be listening to this information. You have a specific question for me, I will be happy to be here after the meeting, as long as it takes. Any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Diaz. I would also like to recognize the Police Review Board members for District 1, Jason Koo, and at-large member, Joanne Now. And I's Police Review Board is a way for residents to have a voice in our, and how our police department serves the city. It has seven members who represent all of our council districts and who care about the issues in all of our neighborhoods. Throughout the year, the board receives input from the public, an outside auditor, and the police department leadership to make recommendations to the city manager and improving, uh, about improving police department practices in various ways. We invite everyone to attend the next meeting of the Police Review Board on Thursday, October the 28th at 6 p.m. There are flyers in the back with more information if you're interested. If you have any questions about the Police Review Board, please see Jason Koo or Joanne now at the end of the meeting. Now, let's move forward with our agenda. Here to provide us with information regarding crime trends and crime prevention is Sergeant Brian Pacwa from the West Community Policing Team. Thank you, Jason. He's a good guy. He's not that good at pool, though. <laughs> Councilman Diaz, thank you for being here. Um, oh yeah, it's so good to be back seeing everybody in person again. It's like all day long I had a smile on my face and I was going to be back here seeing everybody. Um, as Jason said, my name is Sergeant Brian Pacwa. I'm the West District Community Policing Sergeant. 
So for those of you who don't know me, I think I know everybody in this room um, pretty much. I'm, I'm the guy from Virtual Coffee with a Cop. Also, um, my area of responsibility is anything on the West End. So I handle the council districts one and two, everything from basically Euclid to Valley View and La Palma to Ball, anything that happens there. Uh, Long-term problems, uh, my team solves them, or we try to solve them. We, we get with the community and uh, we come up with innovative solutions and we, we try to do what we can. So tonight I'm just going to talk about some of the, the crime stats that I come up with and some of the things you might like to hear. I have uh, actual numbers and stats that anybody can look at after the meeting. Uh, I'll take some questions or as many questions as you got, but if you've you got a specific problem or you want to talk to me or you need my contact information, my contact information and my teams is on the back of the table. I'll be happy to get it to you. Um, but if you have some problems you want to talk about, everybody knows I'll listen. As long as you want to talk, I'll listen. Um, all right, so crime stats. Um, this is for citywide crimes. Uh, against persons are up, up about 4%, which is just a little bit, but it's still up is up, and we always want to see down, not up. Uh, murders, aggravated assaults, all that is also up, um, but property crimes are down about 6%. So property crimes and burglaries and stuff like that. Um, thefts are still the most reported crime in the city, um, but they are, it's the most reported crime, but they're down. So there's, there's that. Uh, before I go into crime trends, I want to talk about uh, one of the elephants in there. You guys heard of Beach Boulevard? Yeah. <laughs> you guys heard of it? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, an, it's an uphill battle, and thanks to Councilman Diaz's office and some, some very concerned neighbors, we're really doing a lot of direct enforcement out there. Um, we're doing what we can to, to get the transients housed and get them the help, and if they don't take the help, there's other options with that. Uh, there's a lot of prostitution on Beach Boulevard. It's actually increasing a little bit. Um, the, lot, the homeless camps are up. So what we're doing is we're doing a lot of direct enforcement operations. You guys not, might not see that. We do a lot of these at night. We did it uh, last night. We'll be out there again tomorrow night. Um, trying, to, trying to just hammer away at this. But uh, it's something that we, we back off for it for just a couple days. We see it, it comes right back. So I, I promise you and I assure you and I, I'm dedicated to fixing you know, Beach Boulevard, especially in a lot of the areas in District 1 that we're having problems with. Um, we have, if you drive down Beach Boulevard now, between like Lincoln and Ball, you're going to see flashing blue lights on a couple of the, the, the light poles there. They're cameras. We tell everybody that. We tell all the bad guys that. We let everybody else know we're not trying to hide them. I want to put gigantic signs on them and say, there are cameras here. You're being watched. We're not trying to be sneaky about it. And these cameras are great. I sit at my desk. I sit at my phone and I watch people and then I call the cars in. And so when we make arrests, um, today we had a, a really good dope arrest at the Chevron. Um, kid had a big old baggie of, of dope. We told him, I saw you right on that. Okay, so hopefully he'll tell his friends, his friends will tell his friends, and they'll be more aware of that or they'll just hide better. But we're going we're gonna to keep moving these cameras around to try and spook them. But we all know, and I think we can all agree, until the hotels are dealt with, Beach Boulevard's always going to be a problem. I moved to Anaheim when I was this big, and Beach Boulevard's always been an issue. Um, but, you know, I get... I get emails and phone calls and text messages from some unhappy neighbors a lot and all I can tell them is we're out there doing the best we can so I, I'm telling you right now I make my promise to you we're, we're working on Beach Boulevard on that if you see a problem on Beach Boulevard or anywhere else in District 1 in the city um, the Anaheim Anytime requests are a great tool I get them all the time um, they sit on my desk and I have to clear them I have to respond back I let you know but it, kept, it lets me know where the problems are and if you give an Anaheim and I, and I have any time requests, and it comes to my desk, and I clear it, and I send it back to you, and you don't like the service, give me a poor marking. Give me a poor marking. Send me an email, call me, say you didn't do it this time, I, would, I want it better, let me know. I, I absolutely love the feedback I get on those. But most of the time, they're excellent. <laughs> All right, another crime trend is catalytic converters. Um, I don't know how this problem is going to be solved. I'm not really savvy on the whole catalytic converters, why they're doing them. I don't know why these recycling places are even taking catalytic converters. Nobody that walks into a shop with five catalytic converters has any reason to have those. So, but there's ways to protect yourselves. There's ways to uh, minimize being a victim on that. And I recommend, I'm going to say this a couple times during my little presentation here, go to our NI, or go to our NIM PD Facebook page and Instagram page. Um, the City of Anaheim page, we put out information all the time on how how to lessen your chances of being a victim, and catalytic converters is one of the things. Now, we have flyers printed out. I don't think we have them here, but they'll probably be up on Instagram or Facebook in the next day or two. Another thing we're starting to notice is distraction burglaries. 
Um, since August, I think we've had five of these, and they're targeting our elderly community. So please watch out for your elderly neighbors. If you see anything suspicious, please call us so we can get a car out there. Um, how it kind of goes is um, there'll be a young kid, female, somebody like that will come to the door posing to be a new neighbor or electric or some type of utility or something like that, and they'll get the resident to go to the backyard. They'll go to the backyard, and then some the burglars will come in and ransack the house, take what they need uh, while they're distracted. They're, it's, uh, they're awful, and they're happening a lot. Uh, I think oh, Orange County Sheriff's had a bunch of them. Westminster's had a bunch of them. Guard Rose had a bunch of them. And I talked to my buddy from Buena Park. They're also having some of them. So it's probably a crew that's going around doing that. So be aware in your neighborhoods that these distraction burglaries are happening and, and report any suspicious um, activity to the PD. Can I get that slide, Carlos? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, on this next slide. This is what we call our blueprint. Uh, I'll tell you that these are the things at the PD we've been doing forever. I've been here 20 some years, we've been doing these things forever, and it's just kind of the way we operate. We're a very proud police department and we like to be professional. But our deputy chief and our command staff has come together and said, hey, let's put this on one card, let's put this on one document, let's show the community what our missions, our values, and our goals are. Um, so our vision, I'm just going to read the vision in partnership with our community will be innovative, strategic, and collaborative on how we provide exceptional public service, safety service, and we do that. Our mission is to, to maintain a safe community to live, work, and play. I'm going to say that one again because that, I feel like that's one that's nearest and dearest to our hearts. Our mission is to maintain a safe community to live, work, and play. I think, that's, I think we can all in agreement say that that's what we want. And so this is what it looks like. Every patrol cop you see out there, every Anaheim officer, this is, we are, we are dedicated now to memorialize this, to memorize this, to know every part of it. Do I click this? Oh, yeah. Here's our vision, our mission, and our values. Those are our values. Respect, commitment to service, integrity, employee wellness, compassion. These are the things, like I said, we've done them all the time. And if we're, if we're failing ourselves or our public on any one of these, let us know. Hold us accountable. And we're going to do the same. We're going to ask for your help with stuff. We can't solve crime. We can't make the neighborhoods better. We can't make them safer without the help of the people sitting in this room. That's our core priority, our foundation, and how we do it. Um, I'm going to read the how we do it because I like that one. And please, Carl, we will be innovative and strategic in how we provide comprehensive public safety service. Okay, the game's changing. Uh, when I was a baby cop 20-some years ago, the things we did then and the things we do now are light years apart. If you would have told me that I was going to be able to write reports and watch cameras in my car, I would have told you you're crazy. Right? I don't even have a pencil anymore and everything, you said, my hands used to be numb from writing pencil reports. Everything's computerized now, everything's digital and we're, we're moving forward. We're the first city to have body cameras and you know, we're, we're, we're leading the charge and I'm sure Sandra will talk about it with the CCRT. We're just trying to find innovative, innovative ways to make the community a safe place to live, work and play. <laughs> Remember that one. All right, so here's our goals, and the, the three bullet points on this is to provide a proactively impact crime, strive to be a high-performing organization, and enhance community relationships. You guys are part of that bottom one. All right, we want to expand relationships in order to aid in maintaining a safe community, increase, increase community trust. Um, that's a big one. Um, it's a smaller world now with the Internet. When we do something bad, they'll know about it in Florida, Georgia, Texas, New York in minutes. Right? When we do something good, not so much. So we have to know that everything we do is, is on somebody's camera. And so when we do the good things, it increases the trust. You know, it takes a lifetime to build trust and about five seconds to lose it, right? So be no act. Um, you can go to the, to the Anaheim PD, or the Anaheim City of Anaheim website and the PD drop down and you can, and you can read for this yourself. But um, I will tell you that this is something that we're gonna have, uh, every officer is gonna memorize every one of these things. It's stuff we've always been doing but it's just been a kind of a, a loose thing, but now it's, now it's in one place. And there's a law enforcement code of ethics. Every one of us as a, as a recruit in the academy is required to memorize this, and uh, I'd like to say we live by it. All right. So that's a blueprint. Uh, recruiting, uh, we have ongoing recruitment right now for laterals um, and new hire police officers. Our chief and our deputy chief are dedicated to hiring um, a lot more new hires, meaning off the street kids, than we, have, than we had in the past. And over the next 
few years in our police department, we're going to have a lot of retirements. And so we're going to have to start building that bank of good people now. So I tell you this because if you know somebody, you know a college kid, if you know somebody in the Marine Corps or the other services, but mostly the Marine Corps. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, mean, they are, I mean, they're kind of like the military. <laughs> um, if you know somebody, if you know a good candidate, send them our way. Send them our way. Um, we need them. It's, it's hard to find good, qualified, smart people. Um, send them our way. Have them call one of our recruiters. Have them call, talk to any cop on the street. Find out what they're looking for. And we, we definitely, uh, it's a great place to work. I love it. I wouldn't change it. Um, Anaheim Confidential. If you hadn't heard what Anaheim Confidential is, it's a fundraiser that we do every year. Um, it's coming up on Friday, November 5th. Tickets are, I think, 38 bucks. You can get them on Eventbrite. It might be on the website, and we may have flyers back there. Carmela, do we have flyers back there on those? Yes. And I'm, okay, and I'm confidential. If you don't know what it is, it's really cool. Um, we have a detective, and they go over a case in the past. One of our murder cases, one of our serial cases, a very interesting case. And it's dinner, drinks, and they go through the PowerPoint, and they talk about it. It's like watching a murder show or one of these cop shows on TV, but it's live. And it's a great fundraiser. It goes to, it goes to some pretty good causes. So if you're not doing anything on November 5th, get out there and, and see this. It's, it's a good time. Looking forward to seeing you there. Dinner and drinks. And it's a... Uh, Five to seven, and the program is from seven to nine. Okay, um, I really don't have much else because I don't want to spend too much time up here. Does anybody have any quick questions for you? Anything that you'd like to know? What's up, Devil Dog? Hey. Number one, I'm Frank. This is my wife, Rita. And, uh, oh, yeah, Frank and Rita. How many police officers do you have in here right now? In this room right now? Four. Stand up and take a bow because <laughs> I had some trouble on the street. And with our councilman here, it was taken care of. There was a 24-hour drugstore, and I heard there was a little casino in there. Oh, yeah. And uh, for two months, I know it takes time, but you guys got it done. Well, thank you. Those things are, they, they, you are, they do take a little bit of paperwork to get done, but we'll knock them out as they come across. And, and by the way, the one you're talking about, Frank, we didn't know about it. It had been operating for months, and we got a... We got an AAR. A citizen told us about it. Hey, I think there's something suspicious well, we here. Did, we watched it. We calling? Yep. Well, thank I you. It might have been you. I to, no, everybody was calling. <laughs> I don't know if you know the house I lived on Hardy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 125, 125, 125 North Harding was where it was, right? Uh, South, South, South Harding. Yeah, 125 South Harding. Right across the street, there was a guy that was going to go to the sheriff's department. He might want to knock on his door. Oh, yeah. The kid? Recruiting? All right. I like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is he Marine? Yes. Oh, I'm definitely going to call him. <laughs> definitely going to call him. I want to thank Mr. Diaz. He came out on a Saturday and spoke with me. I had a couple of neighbors there, and we were all happy. Yeah, he's very accessible. We're lucky to have him. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The uh, last last week <laughs> your uh, last week your chief stated that only 52 percent of the police department employees have been vaccinated. Why isn't it 100 percent? Uh, I believe it's, I'm not going to speak to on behalf of the chief, but it's a personal choice and it's not mandated yet, but we have a thing where if you're vaccinated, you fill out a form letting the uh, city know that you're vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, inside of our police department, you'll wear a mask. Um, but that's a personal and very political uh, hot butt issue right now about the vaccination. So I can't speak for the chief. And 52%, that's what, it's, that's what he said. 52%, that's what he said. Pretty surprising number to me. Yes, sir. The police station on Beach Boulevard is that open for? Is the counter open? No, not yet. No, yet. That, that, thank you for asking that. Uh, our well, my my office is our, our satellite office, like Beach and Lincoln, right there where the community center is. We have our home with our our per team, and we have our West EPT where my office and my team's office is. If you need police and you see a car there and you want to talk to a cop or you have a question, by all means do it. But if you need to file a report, uh, they're not doing those anymore. I don't know when that's going to open up. It's projected it's going to open up eventually when the pandemic uh, comes to a halt. Um, then we'll get some cadets in there and open it up. But right now, I'm sorry, if you need a, like, a police report or file something, you'll have to go to our main station. Can't you just, excuse me, but can't you file a report online? Yes, you can absolutely. There's the, the majority of the reports you, you can file online. Uh, you go to the City of Anaheim website, police drop down, file a report, and it's the same exact thing. A lot of times people just need a, a police report number, or just for documentation, but those do get filed online. But if you actually want to sit down and talk with somebody, you'll have to go to the main station. 
I'm sorry, I have one more question. We had a question over here. Yeah. Just for clarification, you had mentioned, you know, that Anaheim PD is working hard on the beach and ball area. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think there's a misconception, and I'm just bringing this up so you have a chance to clarify. Um, there are residents that believe the Anaheim PD can fix that whole corner, or fix all of Beach Boulevard. And I know that's not true. Can you tell us what that line of demarcation is? What can you do and what other organizations will be doing or can be doing? Well, we just we can do direct enforcement. Okay. Um, we're out there doing direct enforcement. I, it's it's a three pronged attack on that one. Okay, we have our we definitely have our homeless issue out there, and we're we're very lucky to have CCRT and our our perk team out there, and we, we try to get them off the street. We try to get them off the street, and we've been wildly successful. I may I know it probably doesn't appear like that because you drive by and you see an encampment with a bunch of trash and this that. You're like, oh, this you know this intersection is terrible. But what you don't see is the ten people we got housed yesterday. And we got and we got off the street, but there, I, in my opinion, it's wildly successful and it's a great program. And then, then we go to the uh, to the prostitution. Again, we're doing direct enforcement like that. Our our deputy chief, he's he's thrown it in our lap. He says, get out there at night, change your hours, flex your hours, let him know you let him know you're there. He threw up the cameras, so we're working on that as well. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, we we can't. We're never going to fix it, that that problem. And then the other problem is the, is the drugs and the crime that's going on. And I, I can tell you. It's my personal belief and my team's belief that that's directly linked to the hotels. Um, for all of us other old timers in here, these hotels were built in the late 50s with the idea that they were gonna service Disneyland. Okay, well that never happened. Disneyland got its own hotels, Knott's Berry Farm got its own hotels, and now we're stuck with 17 hotels on Beach Boulevard between Beach and Ball. Way out of my pay grade. Someday when that problem is fixed, I think um, we'll see, and someday soon I'm told. Great. I think I that's a great question, thank you very much. You know, I just want to make sure that, it, that you guys get the opportunity that says you can enforce the law, but if someone's not breaking it, you can't just go say that's suspicious, that person's suspicious, and they're walking down the street, so I'm going to grab them. And I think that's what sometimes the community thinks. Oh, that guy's suspicious. The police are going to go get him. And so I just want to make sure it's clear. I mean, we can, we can walk up. To, everybody knows the, the law. We can walk up to anybody and say, hey, do you want to talk to me? Or, hey, can I talk to you? And they can say no and walk away, and we let them go unless we got something else on that one. And that's what we do. It's fishing. Thank no? you, I appreciate that. Okay, I'll take another one. Yes, sir. The reports you do online to the police department, my neighbor kept putting reports in, getting no answer back. Was it a report that required an answer, or was it a cold? Yes. Okay. He, he requested an answer. So if everybody didn't hear his, his question, he says he has a neighbor that did an <clears throat> online report and didn't get any response back. What I would recommend in that one, phone call to the detective, phone call to PD, Anaheim Anytime Request is okay. Anaheim Anytime Request because we are mandated to respond back to those. So that's you have to say I'm not getting a response back like that. And if if, if well, that's if, if you know that they're not getting the response now, can you do something about it? Well, yeah, I mean, of course. But you guys do it, not me. Have your neighbor fill out an Anaheim Anytime Request. Pardon? Have your Anaheim, have your neighbor fill out an Anaheim Anytime Request. Okay. And that's part of the blueprint. We're committed to, to customer service, and it sounds like your neighbor's not getting the customer service that he requires. We've we got to fix it. All right? I agree. Speak with people? Absolutely. All right, if anybody else has any questions or wants, wants to shoot the breeze or talk about some stuff, I'll be available long after this meeting's over. we got to get it moving. Um, thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Sergeant Pacwa. Here to provide us with the community care response team and code enforcement updates. Sandra Lozo, our Community Preservation Manager. Thank you, Jason. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so we're, I'll go ahead and start with our Community Care Response Team. Uh, for those of you that um, didn't know, we do have a pilot program that started on January 1st of this year. Uh, our council members uh, unanimously voted in to try this pilot program. Our Community Care Response Team, or CCRT, is a program where we put skilled professionals out in the field and we had a few goals in mind during this pilot program that is now going to be coming to an end at the end of this year but we are going to be looking to continue that program that program is 2.5 million dollars but is not of our dollars this is actual restricted funds uh, from our federal emergency solutions grant restricted for covid and homeless uh, so this is additional money that we received that we had to put towards a program and we thought this would be a great fit. The four goals at the beginning of the year was one, to divert 
uh, homeless calls for service that did not have a criminal nexus or were non-emergency away from our police responding to have our CCRT respond. And the idea of that was um, a lot of times our community and all of us were just accustomed, especially 24-7, uh, to call our police department. And so now having CCRT out there seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. when the majority of the homeless calls for service were coming into the PD, uh, to divert those to skilled professionals out in the field, to try and have a different approach uh, to try and get more people off the street, which was a second goal of ours. The third goal was related to COVID. Obviously, this was started in the middle of COVID, and we wanted to try and uh, slow the spread of COVID out in the streets. Obviously, if any of us got COVID or were exposed to it or a close contact, we had the ability to go home and quarantine. Obviously, if you're unhoused, you don't have that privilege, and so we wanted to make sure we were able to address that out in the field. And then the fourth goal was to try and get a best practice. It is a pilot program see what we can approve upon, and try and create a standard of practice countywide. So since that program, we did do a six-month update to our city council that you can see online. Uh, it did show that we are getting more people off the street by having CCRT out there every day. They're averaging about 3.8 people a day off the street with a 90% retention rate, meaning by the time we get them there and get them into a sheltered environment, they tend to stay in that. Now, uh, homelessness, unfortunately, is a management system. It's not like we have so many homeless and we're gonna solve it by getting all, rounding them all up and, and getting them all housed. It is a management system, especially with eviction moratoriums coming to a close. We have to make sure we have a system in place to catch people, prevent homelessness, but also those on the streets to find resources to house them. Since the six-month pilot, we've been diverting almost 20% of our calls for service coming into police dispatch away from police responding and having CCRT respond first. So that's been alleviating a little bit on the police dispatch from having to go out to these calls for service. And instead of a badge and gun showing up, now there's some skilled professionals, so it's a little bit of a different environment and building a different trust out there, but at the same time, if PD is out there doing other types of um, enforcement measures and they come across uh, people that are unhoused and are looking for shelter, they can call CCRT to come help with that. And then vice versa. If CCRT is working with a group that may be um, unresponsive or uncooperative, then we can call our police uh, to assist with that. So what we call is that balance of outreach and enforcement, what seems to be working out there for us right now. Uh, we have over 290 people in our shelters currently, as of today, that would otherwise be out on our streets. Um, out of those shelters, we've housed hundreds of people since we started in January of 2019. Uh, we opened up the El Verano Project, which was a homeless, uh, formerly, for formerly homeless seniors. Uh, it was the old Sandman Motel off of East and Lincoln. Uh, we added that to our uh, inventory for permanent supportive housing, and we were able to pull 50 of our formerly homeless seniors out of our shelters into that housing before Christmas last year. We just recently opened up a motel conversion, which was a, a first of its kind, where we did a motel conversion ordinance with the city. And that was over here on your district, over off of Magnolia, and I think it's La Palma or Lincoln, I can't remember which the street is. Uh, but it was Old Econo Lodge and is now Buena Esperanza that has 69 units that are almost full already that just opened up. So we're, again, we're trying to create that system so as people get into the shelter, it's temporary, we figure out what needs they have, stabilize them, and then find the right housing for them. So that seems to be working. Uh, the great part of that is uh, we are diverting calls, which was a goal of ours. Uh, the next set of calls that uh, the PD are looking at diverting that are related to homelessness is trespassing. And what we envision trespassing is usually if someone's on our property, we call the police because someone's trespassing on our property. The homeless calls for trespassing are usually people calling because someone's trespassing on a vacant lot or on the railroad property or Caltrans, that sort of stuff. So we're going to try and test pilot this month to divert some low-level crime calls like trespassing away from the PD responding first to have our CCRT go out uh, and provide outreach services, but then also provide a trespassing warning and let them know. And it's a different conversation. Uh, from that group then a police officer coming out and issuing a trespassing warning so our hope is that they will understand that they're not on public property that they're on private property 
and that um, they need to understand that they are trespassing and they could get another call. So our hope is we're diverting that first call and maybe avoiding a second call coming in uh, from them trespassing. So we're going to be test piloting that in the next few months and then going back to council for an extension of this program into next calendar year. The other thing that went to council just the other night was a proposal for another pilot program related to mental health. And this is Be Well OC. This is one of the first facilities that have gone up in Orange County. It's in the city of Orange. And this is for mental health services. They have residential programs at this facility. They have up to 100 beds. And in that facility, they have second and third floor residential programs for substance abuse and mental health or crisis stab stabilization. This is something that if people have been around long enough, uh, JFK signed, uh, it was the final bill he signed um, before he was assassinated, where he was trying to uh, take people out of those uh, in mental institutions and put them into community centers closer to the homes and the communities, uh, but that never came to fruition and we're now starting to see that with these community centers coming up like Be Well OC. There is a second facility going up in the city of Irvine, and that one's going to be 22 acres. The one at Orange is only two acres, so you can imagine it's going to be hundreds of beds there. So we're going to continue to allow to have additional mental health beds that we didn't have before. Before we had like 10 beds in the entire county. And that's not a lot for housed and unhoused individuals. Our police department's already using that facility. They're able to just drive in with an individual, uh, drop them off in a matter of 15, 20 minutes instead of sitting in a hospital. So it's a private-public partnership uh, with the hospitals like Hogue, Kaiser, St. Joseph, and that because they recognize they need a different type of service than the emergency room. So our proposal that was approved by council uh, unanimously is to have Be Well in a mobile unit that is now gonna be taking mental health calls away from police and fire that are non-emergency, non-criminal related. So somebody may be talking to themselves on a corner. Uh, maybe they get out there on somebody and there is no criminal nexus, they can call Be Well, they can transport people to the facility and they're gonna overlap with our CCRT. CCRT is only for homeless, but Be Well will be able to make house visits for people that may have individuals and family members in health crisis to actually come to your home and address those there. And if you need to be transported or have a loved one transport, they'll be able to do that. The idea to how it complements and works with CCRT is if CCRT has someone that needs to go to a Be Well facility, right now we take them over there. Uh, by having the BULSC van with us, uh, they'll be actually be able to transport and we can continue to have CCRT in the field. And vice versa, PD will be able to call uh, the Be Well van to come get them instead of taking a police uh, vehicle out of service or a fire engine. Uh, so that again, that's gonna be a one-year pilot program being paid out of CARES Act money, again, not taxpayer money of ours, uh, but we figure that's gonna be another tool in our toolbox uh, to have more uh, social service calls being responded to by skilled professionals instead of police and fire if they're not needed. Um, we'll be coming back to council with some updates on that and how well that program's going. We still are gonna keep our PERC team, which is for our police with our mental health clinician, and that's gonna be responding to a lot more of the police calls that they need to do. So again, we're gonna have a lot of tools out there in the field to help, no matter what the person's situation, housing situation, mental health state, that sort of stuff. We're gonna have a bunch of different people we can call. Uh, I'll move over to code enforcement updates. I have uh, street vending seems to be a big one right now. Um, there was a state law that changed in January of 2019. And basically that came out of a lawsuit in LA related to the street vendors over there, more so around immigration, but what they ended up doing with the state law is decriminalizing street vending. So this is not a police issue, and I know our police officers have gotten a lot of calls, so we've been working with them. And it's not even really a code enforcement issue. So we had to repeal our prohibition on street vending. We used to just prohibit it, so we would pick up those ice cream carts and fruit carts, and we couldn't do that anymore with this new state law. We have to regulate them. However, the one enforcement tool that the state law allows is related to food. So if they have food, like the fruit vendors or the taco stands we're seeing, they have to have an Orange County health permit. Most of them do not. You have to have a pretty big setup uh, with cleaning requirements and, and a sink and that sort of stuff. Santa Ana has some permitted ones in their downtown area. And in the state law, the only enforcement agency allowed to do any type of misdemeanor or criminal 
um, enforcement is the food facility regulators, which is the Orange County Health Department. The city cannot. The only uh, officers that can do any enforcement are health officers, not any of us. But our council member wanted to figure out and strategize and be creative. So we contacted the Orange County Health Department. Obviously, they're getting a lot of calls uh, to do enforcement, and they're overburdened, and we want to help. Uh, and so some of the restrictions they have is not having enough staff. Uh, not having enough people out there kind of doing surveillance to make sure if there's illegal activity. Uh, and then also storage of equipment that they do confiscate. So of course Anaheim, we took a step forward and leaned in with them and said we want to partner with you, we want to help. So it actually started today uh, at, with the, the help of our council members to actually partner with the Orange County Health Department. So we're going to be out two days a week and one night on the weekends to start doing heavy enforcement uh, related to food vendors. The flower vendors are a little more difficult. They can get a permit pretty easily. We have about six throughout the city that are permitted, uh, but they tend to stay out of the sidewalk area, stay out of the, the street me, uh, median. So we can still do enforcement of them not having a permit with us, but it is not um, a criminal offense. It's more of an administrative fine on our part, but we still will go out there. Same thing with the cell phone vendors. Uh, so we're working that on the code enforcement side. Uh, but today we hit a lot of different vendors throughout the city, so continue to use Anaheim anytime, continue to use my Anaheim app, and let us know, because uh, I know we give kind of a standard response back because there's not much we can do, but now that we're partnering with the county, we're pulling all that data from everybody's complaints, and we're finding those hot spots. So we're hitting, I think Dearden's is a big one that has a big taco stand, um, there, so there's a spread throughout the, the city. I know there's some on Magnolia, so we're going to start hitting them. But we're going to try and be equitable. So we're not just going to hit in one district. We're going to try and hit a few in every district. We were out here on Beach Boulevard today on some of the vendors, and we'll continue to do that. So that's a huge one. It's unique. Uh, but we found a creative process that we're going to be working. And then as we confiscate for the county, we'll be storing that for them. And so that's going to help them a little bit on their end. So I know that was a lot of information, but that's my biggest updates. Happy to answer a couple questions. Um. ADA issue with the, these stands that are set up on sidewalks. Uh, I presume they, if they're not giving the 36 or I forget the exact amount of inches to for the bypass of uh, wheelchairs and other types of mobility devices. Yes. Uh, is that the enforceable law? Yes. So the question was related to ADA and blocking the sidewalk on these vendors, yes, we can do enforcement on that. And that even includes if they have a canopy where that may look like there's 36 inches, but there is the post of the canopy in the middle of the sidewalk, that does not count, that's still blocking. It has to have be a clear path of 36 inches. So we do do that enforcement, because that is a city code that we can do. That's not even related to the vending, it's just the fact that anybody's blocking more than 36 inches. So that's a code enforcement uh, report? Yes. And just let us know there's a vendor out there and they're blocking uh, the sidewalk where there's not enough passage through. Because that helps us when we have a complaint from the public that they can't get by um, because of ADA. That helps us on our enforcement. Um, how about these taco stands, like an orange and a brokerst? Yeah, so the taco stands. How, with do you, how do you report those? Through Anaheim Anytime. Okay. So uh, the, the health department is very focused on the taco stands. Uh, those seem to be the big setups, two or three canopies. Mm -hmm. um, they're making a lot of business and they're impacting our brick and mortar taco places, right? Um, that are paying the health department and, and paying their fees and taxes. So that's where our focus is, is on the taco stands and the fruit vendors. Yes, ma'am. In regards to diverting calls for trespassing, did I understand correctly that when those calls come in to the Anaheim 911 call center, will one of those representatives be diverting that directly, or will an officer go first and then say someone else come in? It could be both. So uh, that was a good question last night from one of our council members, is how is that going to kind of work? So we're training, our PD is going to be training our dispatch on all these calls coming in, depending on what they're related to, if there is no criminal nexus, now they're gonna have all these buckets that they can choose from. They can send Be Well, they can send CCRT, 
that sort of stuff. There may be some trespassing calls we still need to have PD respond, but they're going to make that call first until we get comfortable with how CCRT is doing and then divert more and more calls that way. But right now, the calls that PD are still responding to that are homeless related, about 25% of those are trespassing. So we're hoping that we can make a big impact on that group of calls. Thank you. Nine one one should only be for emergency, but a lot of people do not, um, and so our dispatchers are very good about uh, triaging those very quickly to make sure they're able to address the emergency ones first, and then make sure other people can answer those. So if it's non-emergency, they should be calling the non-emergency line, the nineteen hundred number. And is there a two one one number? What's that? Is there another number that's a city number to call for services? Three one one. And that's our Anaheim Anytime during the day. If you call 311, you'll go through our Anaheim Anytime. Maybe we need to promote that. Just see anything going on. Call 911, call the plate, call 911. Yeah. And it's like, okay, wait, just stop for a second. Is this an emergency? And so, yeah, so the 311 is when it starts to evolve. Yeah, and the. Correct. And the chief talked last night about as we have all these social services out there, trying to create one phone number or one line of communication. Because right now you can call CCRT directly and not bug our police dispatch now, which has been working really, really well. Uh, so we're going to try and work on that. But we understand we have multiple agencies helping us and trying to figure out that communication plan is going forward. Uh, the question was about community feedback uh, with CCRT. So uh, CCRT do have uniforms and they do have their vehicles with the information on their um, truck that says uh, the community care response team. Uh, but we're making sure we're communicating that. Um, so it, there is an education process, but we, we see now our direct community calls are going up and our police calls into dispatch are going down a little bit, which is good. Um, so we even have homeless individuals that get a moment of clarity or they find out a good number to call CCRT and it could be at 8 o'clock at night and CCRT will go out there and grab them and take them to a sheltered environment and help them out where we can where before we didn't have that luxury. So there's some really good um, things going on in there and we're hoping with Be Well and some other stuff that we're working on we're going to be able to help more people and Be Well is going to go all the way from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. So there's going to be overlap with CCRT and going into the evening, which is going to be terrific for us. The, um, the people that work in the park department will go by and see a truck come in and do some service in the park. Do they have a way to contact people when they see things? Are they encouraged to do that? Yeah, the, you know, a lot of times they're you know, kind of quickly to get in the, the, the trash now. But they really can do you know, eyes and ears because they're there. The question is about in our parks with the park rangers and, and park maintenance employees. and other city employees. Yes. And they can see a lot of things. Are they encouraged to just make a phone Yes, absolutely. So we have librarians. We have public works folks. Uh, utilities folks. Believe it or not, they've opened up vaults and found homeless individuals sleeping in them. Um, and so all of these departments are impacted, but now they have a, a phone number and, a, and a, someone to call. So they're appreciative of that. Our park rangers, our park maintenance staff, uh, a lot of people call that line to get some help and, and get stuff addressed, especially our librarians. We have a lot of individuals uh, go into our libraries, and they are quick to offer resources and help them out and get our CCRT over to them. All right, thank you. Teresa Bass, our city clerk. Teresa? Good evening, everyone. I'll just give a um, few moments, and we do have a PowerPoint that I want to share with everyone. So thank you, everyone, for having me here, um, giving me the opportunity to speak to you and share some information regarding our redistricting process and what that means. So to provide some background, as you see the map um, on our projection screen, it's going to pop up shortly. There it is. Um, so the, what the map you see currently right here, this is our current district map. And this is a map that was first, our first boundary map that um, the city council approved back in 2016. 
And that map that was created was using the 2010 census data, as was required by law as we were um, going through the redistricting process when we first entered into transitioning for our council members to be elected at large to trans transitioning to be elected by districts. So pursuant to our city charter, um, after any federal census that's completed and done by the federal government, the community and the city needs to come together and revisit the map that was first, that is being, being currently used. Um, and with that information, um, we go back, we review the information that we're getting from the census, see the population and see how that relates to the current map that we're using. So with the census data that we received that, we are currently going through the redistricting process, getting the information from our census data and evaluating and seeing if we need to adjust our district boundaries so that we could continue to represent each of our districts equally and that they're equally um, populated across the city. So now that we're in this process, um, we are going through um, receiving the census data as we're receiving that. Typically, we would have received that information from the federal government earlier part of this year, of this January, um, January, February, March of this year of 2021. But given with the pandemic um, and given the just the issues that we went to get the information, the federal government did delay that process of us receiving that information. So we just recently received, this past month of September, um, the federal census data and the most recent numbers that um, we received from the district with regards to the census updates with regards to the population. So what I wanted to share with you is what that means. And now that we're in the midst of the redistricting process, what are our next steps? So within the redistricting process, we are conducting a series of public hearings before the city council and the community and to solicit input and information and providing the information not only of the redistricting process, but also the input from the community as we look at redrawing these district boundaries. So during the past month, the month of September, we have an opportunity to have those initial meetings with our community. We went and we held seven community meetings, um, one of them that we did have virtual. Um, going to each of the six districts and soliciting the information of the community so you talk about your neighborhoods, your community's interest as we start reviewing and reviewing the maps and the boundary gu guidelines as we are looking to redraw those district boundaries. So at this time, we are reaching out to you. We're asking community members to submit their information, their input, as well as looking at the current district map and proposing district boundary maps and proposing those to council for our con their consideration to review. We are asking currently um, that in October 22nd, we are asking the community to come back and submit those proposed maps um, to the council so that we can bring them forward at our November 2nd, 2021 public hearing. Following that, the public hearing, we're asking council will be presenting all the maps that are being presented by the community, as well as we're working with the demographer, seeing the criteria, the guidelines, given the population and what are those adjustments to look at, and presenting that at that public hearing on November 2nd. At that time, following that, we are gonna be bringing any of those draft maps that were presented to city council at that council meeting, and have a second series of community meetings so we can have an opportunity to, to present these proposed draft maps to the community for additional feedback. And this is not the only time that, that October 22nd that we're asking for only like a deadline for the district proposed maps, but we're asking for additional time for the community to provide any changes to those maps, recommendations, revisions, as we are looking at the draft maps that were presented at the November, 20, November 2nd public hearing. So following the November, December community meetings, the information, the input that we get from the community, we're going back to council in January or February to present the information and the input that we got at the community, as well as if there was any revisions and changes to the draft maps that were first presented. At that time, we're hoping that we reach a final map, an adoption of a map, and that will be considered for council for consideration of adoption. Um, pursuant to the federal um, guidelines and state codes, we need to complete this process and adopt a map by April 17th of 2022 so that we can use that district map once we um, come into our general municipal election that we'll be having in 20, um, 2022, November of 2022. So you may ask, how do I submit maps? Or what is the information or what are the tools that we have? 
So on the city's redistricting website, we do have at anaheimredistricting.org, which is the city's website that we're using to provide all the information, we have a series of mapping tools um, for different levels and technical levels and interest. We have a simple mapping, what we call a paper kit, mapping tool that we even have here available today that provides the maps, the data, and so forth, so the community together can look at this map and start creating those district boundaries and present those for consideration. We have also have some technical um, mapping programs and applications um, that have more of an um, internet-based and application that you can go ahead and draw maps. This does take some learning curve. We do have some um, tutorials on our website that shows you the application, how to use the application, how to draw those lines, and use the sources and the tools um, in order how to use this application. But what we're doing within on our um, Anaheim Redistricting um, website is we have a variety of ways for the communities to submit those proposed maps. Simply by submitting using the paper tool or doing some more advanced application that we have that we'll have available on our website. So as mentioned, anaheimredistricting.org is our redistricting website where we have all the information regarding the redistricting process. Um, the series of committee meetings that we held in the month of September, we have actually all the audio recordings, a video recording of a meeting that we held at Ponderosa Resource Center, as well as the virtual Zoom meeting um, that we hosted as well that provides that information that was presented. So it gives an opportunity for those that weren't unable to attend our September meetings, but to have the opportunity to see what was discussed and the information that we was presented to um, the council at our public hearing that we had this last Tuesday. Um, we also have, as mentioned, all the mapping tools that could be utilized and contact here. And we also have the schedule and outlining the different dates, as mentioned previously, the public hearings that are coming forward, the additional community meetings that we'll be having in the community as we look at the draft maps, as well as the updates and um, public hearings that we'll be having in the future up till we receive that last date of April 17th, where we need to reach that deadline to submit and adopt that map. We also have an opportunity for um, residents to fill out um, any comments. Um, there is a questionnaire or contact me information um, subscription that you can, if you have any questions, um, if you have information that you want to submit for consideration, any feedback regarding um, the current um, mapping or any of the revised maps and drafts maps, so it gives an opportunity for you to submit those questions to us and then we can present those to City Council during our public hearings. Um, redistricting at Anaheim.net is an email that we're using. Um, so again, not only the form, but also so you can submit your questions to on um, the, um, submit those questions and bring them forward. And we can go ahead and be happy to answer those. This afternoon and this evening, we do have a sign-in sheet. Um, we're asking those that are interested to get updated information regarding the redistricting process and get updates on upcoming meetings. Feel free to do include your information, your email information, and we'll include you on a Notify Me subscription list that will go ahead and provide you those updates as we continue through the redistricting process. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. Who exactly is drawing up the maps that will be in the first round of presentation? Who's, who's doing that? Who's drawing up those maps? And then uh, does the Anaheim City Council, at the end of this process, can they can the council itself change any map uh, arrangements? So the question is, was, um, who, where are we getting the first maps? Where are the maps coming from? And does the council have an opportunity to change those maps? Actually, those maps are the community. That's the community, we're asking for the community to submit those maps. So as we're looking at the information of the um, different districts that we currently have, we're providing the mapping tools so that we can go ahead and get those maps for any interested community member, organization, that wants to submit a map for um, consideration. We also have a demographer on board that's on with our um, redistricting team, working with the city clerk's office, that is not only using the information definitely from the census data, because we need to by certain criteria and guidelines to ensure the districts are equally populated, but he's also using the information that we're going and receiving from the community with regards to communities of interest and neighborhoods, and the demographer will be creating some three or four maps also meeting those criteria and the meeting the criteria, the census data, and presenting that for city council. 
that the demographer is a city employee or an outside uh, consultant? It's an outside consultant. Um, Dr. Justin Levitt, um, he is with NDC. Actually, he was part of the process. Um, let me just repeat the question. He asked um, who the demographer was, if it's a city employee or outside consultant. So Dr. Justin Levitt is our demographer. Um, he actually was part of the process in 2016, so he has some historical, so we were really happy to get him on board um, to provide some historical information regarding the jurisdiction process. But he is the one that's assisting and working with the committee and working with the city and, and creating these maps and bringing them forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. The uh, seventh district decided to be uh, selected by the uh, city council or is it going to be to the uh, general public? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Who's going to decide on the seventh district? The, 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 uh, the maps themselves? So the seven, question is... The uh, seventh district, the, the, the new district. It's got to go through the uh, borders. The seventh district that goes before. So currently we have the six districts um, that we have in the city of Anaheim. Um, as those, we are looking at those of adjusting those boundary lines to meet the new census data. That is going to be presented to council with additional maps that we're receiving. So the maps will be presented to council and definitely with the feedback that we're getting from the community. But the, at the, um, the city council will be adopting the new map as they did in 2016. Yes, ma'am. In regards to um, potential map changing, I understand that some of the districts currently have an excess amount of, of new residents. They may need to split those. Would there be a situation where a councilman would no longer be in a district? And would a new election have to happen? So the question is um, knowing that in some districts there need to be some adjustments to the boundary lines. And if a current sitting council member that represents that district, does that mean they're no longer representing um, that district? So if there's any changes to the boundary lines, given the adjustments that need to in, um, ensure that we have those equal population, that current council member continues to serve to their end of their term. And then that would be for the new election for then any um, changes to that. But because the changes in the adjustment does not change, um, or impact the current city member. Thank you. So there will be a new election. We will continue with the election, so we still will have our November of 2022, given the new boundary map, but it will still, it would be just the continued of the next uh, council members that are up for re-election. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry, can you, repeat, can you repeat that question again? We have a priority in this process to have each district have approximately the same number of people represented in each district. Yes, so the... Why do we have that? That's given with the guidelines by the federal government and the state. Because we have, you know, geographically, when you look at Anaheim Hills and how big that has to be to get the number of people, there's disparities in that whole group already. And if they, because it's sparsely populated compared to the inner city, uh, it just seems that it would make sense that that would be a geographical area. And um, the other one, because we have our mayors elected at large, and so that everybody votes for the mayor, and every council is elected by this district, so whether you have 30,000 people in your district or Um, so the comment was, um, given that seeing how large city of Anaheim is and given just different areas that based on is the priority given to div divide or adjust the boundaries given on population. Um, and yes, that is, that is the priority given the fair mass act because you are 
wanting the council members, each of the council district council are representing an equal population of individuals. So you're, you have your entire city of Anaheim, the districts are divided within those boundaries, so each district equally represents a population of the community. I think one point that needs to be made is districts one, two, and six right now are about the right amount of population. 58,000 plus or minus. Districts three and four need about 3,000 residents to be moved from district five, which has about 6,000 residents, too many. So based on the numbers, that's probably what will happen. One and two will remain the same, six will remain the same. Then we just take some parts of five and give it to three and four. But that's not that's the most easiest based on numbers and things. Things can be done other, other ways. You want to draw the map. That mapping tool that comes up next week, we'll look at the numbers to make sure you are having the right amount of people in each district. So thank you, Mr. Clave. He's been actually participating at each of our community meetings. So he is sharing some information with regards to what our current census data information that has come out. Um, as given the data as currently, um, it does show that one, two, and six, given the equal population divided across the, the city of Anaheim, those don't deviate from that, re that kind of that um, optimal number that we're trying to reach to have that equal population. District five, we saw more of an increase, and districts two, um, three and four, we saw that they're underpopulated. So within those areas is where we see that there would be some adjustments given so that we can have that equal population. Not saying that those are the only adjustments or the only two or three and four would be adjusted. Again, it goes to the community as they're looking at each of the, um, the districts. Um, but right, as of right now, the census data showed that, that we did see increase in District 5 and then the lower population in 3 and 4. So the comment was that the census data is based on the census information that was received during the census process and not any future developments, and that's true. Um, we, the mapping of the district maps are based on the federal census data, and that is what is mandated. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, we will be available at the um, following the meeting to answer any, ad any additional questions. Um, continue. AnaheimRedistricting.org. We have all the information regarding the redistricting process. Um, we post all the staff reports, the meetings. Um, actually, uh, last night's council meeting, we had the public hearing. If you go to that website, it actually has the video and um, the presentation and the comments that we received. So definitely um, use this um, website as a source of information regarding the process. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Teresa. Here to talk to us about conservation programs is Andrew Marcus from the Anaheim Public Utilities. Andrew? So, we're an hour in. How's everybody doing? <laughs> you guys are doing okay? All right, good. We're going we're gonna to go through this pretty good, pretty quickly, but um, let me adjust this. Y'all can hear me well. All right. Um, so again, my name is Andrew Marcus. Uh, I work for Anaheim Public Utilities. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, we do the energy and water for the utility, uh, for the city of Anaheim, really. And what's exciting about what we do is we're a publicly owned utility. So we're an island in what most people think of Edison, right? Your neighbors outside, um, they're all getting power, uh, electricity from Edison or other sorts of water districts. Um, so we provide energy and water to the city of Anaheim and your city owns your utility. This is an exciting component, it's really uh, of a value add that we have here in Anaheim. Um, just a little bit about our mission is to deliver safe, reliable, affordable and sustainable electricity and water to the residents and businesses of Anaheim. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit of some of the programs that we offer our residents. Uh, we like to call it ways to save. 
This is just really a quick agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about our water and energy efficiency programs, some of our income qualified assistance programs, uh, our bill assistance programs, and more generally speaking around our sustainability initiatives as a utility. Uh, it's a big part of what we do. So, jumping right in, our water and energy programs. So, if you're thinking about waste, you're, obviously you get your bill every two months and you're freaking out, right? Because it's crazy. Uh, I live in Anaheim, so there's ways that you can look at um, conserving energy and conserving water. And one of which is our home utility checkup program. This is our pride and joy. This is our big program that uh, I think we see a lot of participation in and we see a lot of value. We have our, our uh, vendor come out to your home and we help you identify ways to save energy and, like, and water throughout your indoor and throughout your outdoor um, areas. So we also provide you with a, with a uh, survey that talks about your prior energy and water usage. We go over your bill with you and we talk to you about all of a variety of different programs. Um, so that's a great start. I would start there. Our home utility checkup program um, allows for a lot of good information. We also have a variety of different rebate programs. So if you're looking to install a new refrigerator or a new air conditioner, we have ways to help you um, pay for those through rebates. We also have a refrigerator recycling program. So if you have an extra fridge or let's say you're trying to replace your, your fridge from your, uh, from in your kitchen, we give you a rebate to do that and we pick it up at your house for free. Um, our tree power program, so if you're looking to install or plant, really, um, trees to, cr to create shade around your home and beautify your home, we give you six free shade trees. And we come out to the home, we help you identify where you can plant it, and then we deliver it to you as well. Um, our turf replacement program, getting into the water efficiency piece, 60% of, of your water goes to outdoor. And so looking at where what you have in your landscape, whether it's a lot of grass or you have shrubs, bushes, um, this is a program where you can replace that turf and install drought tolerant plants to help conserve uh, water. We also have rebates for weather-based irrigation controllers and what those are really is, it's like a smart irrigation controller. It sets up to your internet and it identifies uh, the season, it identifies if there's precipitation in the air. So I have one of these and it shut my sprinklers off yesterday and today because it knew that it, it rained a few days ago. So um, those are things that it does automatically and it helps you conserve that way. We also have a variety of different income qualified programs. Uh, what we did recently about a year or so ago was we streamlined our income qualifications. So before they were a little mix matched around, but right now all of our income qualified programs uh, meet the 80% of the Orange County median income. So right here on the right, um, you see what it says, family of four is roughly $107,000 or below. You meet those income criteria. So most of the programs that we have here um, that I'm going to talk about, as long as you meet those criteria, um, you're welcome to participate. I also have the full list in the back of the table uh, that talks about you know, how many people, family one, two, three, and so forth. So one of the main programs that we like to um, present is our weatherization program and that's where we it's basically a more robust program than our home utility checkup so we come out to the home and we install ceiling fans we do air conditioner tune-ups we give you free toilets um, that's kind of a, free toilets right um, what, what did you do today Andrew a di you know, a dinner talk to my wife uh, we help install toilets um, but uh, we do we give out toilets we give out um, uh, ceiling fans, a variety of different measures. So this is all actually the next step. So if you're finding ways, you know, we do the home utility checkup, we identify things around the house that you can, uh, you know, save. Um, now this is where we come out and we do big installs and it's all for free. You get about $1,000 worth of uh, free installs for electric and 500 for water. So it's a good, robust program. We also have a leak repair rebate. So if you do find out that you have a leak, uh, whether it's a slab leak, which is horrible, or just a, a leaky toilet or a leaky faucet or whatnot, we have a rebate for that up to $250 that you can uh, apply for and participate and receive funding back. The two programs here is our senior, disabled, and veteran discount, as well as our green power discount. So these are discounts on your bill. 
So the first one, the Senior Disabled and Military Veteran, that program gets you 10% off on your electric and 10% off on your water bill. And so applications on our website, I also have some in the back. And we can talk about that after if you have any questions. Um, so that's basically a flat rate. So when you get your bill, you're going to get a discount, right, 10% off the top of those electric and water. The next one is our green power discount. That one is um, solely based on the, your income, and that one is a $10 flat discount for six months. So it's $60 a year. And then you can reapply again the year following. So you'll get $60, $60 each year. Um, and then the last one is our Dust to Dawn program. Um, so if you have outdoor lighting needs, if you ever walk outside and you're like, it's real dark on the corner of my house or at the front of my house or side yard, backyard, we have uh, free Dust to Dawn lights that can turn on and stay on throughout the evening and shut off um, during the daytime. And we also help you install them for free. So that's a great program that we do offer as well. So our bill assistance programs. So we've gone over ways that you can conserve, uh, rebates, some of our direct installation programs, such as our weatherization. But if you're still having finding trouble uh, paying for your bill, we do have ways to assist you with that. Uh, we've come across that a lot recently with, with COVID. Obviously, a lot of people were impacted financially. Um, so our first one is our emergency assistance program. And with that program, we offer $250 for your electric and $100 for your water. And it's a lifetime cap, okay? So once you use that up, um, that's it. So that program, you can apply by going, by calling us um, or going onto our website. And that covers those, that total $350, that covers your, any past due balances. So if you're past due, if let's say you're, you know, a couple months past due, this is where this assistant, assistance comes into play. Our customer service department, the team there, the, the division there, they're the people you, you could call, ask them, you know, how, how past due am I and how do I apply for this program? They'll, they're the ones that can help you with that. We also have our low-income uh, home energy assistance program. It's LIHEAP for short. And that's through a third-party agency called Community Action Partnership of Orange County, or CAPOC, if you're familiar with that acronym. Um, they're out here, borderline Anaheim, Buena Park, and they also provide assistance for um, paying down any prior balances. And they go as high as I've seen almost $700 to $1,000. So they do a lot of help um, for not only electric, but also gas. Um, we also have a medical lifeline allowance. And what that is, is if you have any equipment in your home that uses a lot of power, um, even air conditioning. If you have to have air conditioning on for long periods of time to keep temperatures at a certain um, rate, we offer our medical lifeline, which basically allows you more energy at our lower rate. And so it gives you a little bit of a buffer there. Um, that's super helpful, as well as uh, we also have our monthly payment plans. So give us a call. If you're struggling, if you have any, you know, need help paying your bill, we have these programs, but we'll also create a payment plan for you and we'll, we'll, work, we'll work with you on those payments. Uh, lastly is our sustainability initiatives. So right now, 33% of the power that we receive is renewable, All right, So it's green energy. Um, we're looking to go 60% by 2040, so this is a big ambitious goal. We, uh, our general manager, Dooku, likes to say we're, we don't live in a red or a blue state, we live in a green state. So it's really true and impactful um, here in, in California, and especially as a utility. Um, to, to provide that green energy. If you're interested or if you're looking at buying an electric vehicle, we have rebates to, to incentivize electric vehicle charging stations. So we're, we're doing that. Uh, we have a few charging stations here at Brookhurst, if you've noticed in the parking lot. Um, but if you're installing any charging stations in your home, we offer rebates for you to help you with those costs um, as well. And then also, lastly, we do school education programs. So our team goes out and we talk to K through 12 uh, students and uh, teach them about conservation, teach them about um, how to be sustainable and how to make those uh, sustainable initiatives in their lives. So can't leave you without safe water, right? So right now, you may have heard um, the state is now starting to look at uh, impacts across um, drought impacts. 
So one of the things that we're promoting now and starting to really get ahead of is conserving water, uh, making sure that we're uh, not wasting water is our main primary focus. So that's repairing any leaks that you have at your home. We have the leak repair rebate. Replacing any old appliances that you think um, you know, need it, like toilets, high, you know, high gallon um, toilets, reducing those down, um, as well as the lawns and reducing some of your outdoor irrigation. So those rebates can come in handy. We do have a few um, uh, landscape workshops that we're having in the month of October and November. So the next one is October 14th, and that's in downtown community center. And we're going to be talking about drought tolerant gardens. And then on November 13th is going to be uh, succulents, and that's in East Anaheim. So we have some community events and some, uh, some movement there, which if you're interested in learning about this information or maybe trying it out at home by yourselves, uh, these are some great opportunities to learn about that. And we, we learned a little bit about this earlier from, uh, from our police. Customer safety and fraud is a big thing. So a lot of our customers right now are getting calls, basically saying you're late on your bill and you owe us X amount of dollars. Uh, we will never do that, first and foremost. We don't take, we will never call you and try and take payment over the phone. You call us and we have a system in place where you would you know, do that sort of thing. So what happens is, is you'll get a, a, a scammer, they'll call you and say, hey, you owe us $400 or we're gonna shut you off. And we're from Anaheim Public Utilities. And they'll say, go and do, go to a local um, like 7-Eleven or, or grocery store and pick up what's called a, um, where is it here? A green dot card. And you buy this green dot card, you put that money on that card and you call them back and you give them the, the number on the card. And then that transfers over to them. So I've actually gotten calls in the past and I've followed this process through just to see what they say, how it goes. And it's crazy because it's literally, they say, to go to the store, find it on the counter, on the register to the right. Um, you'll see it says green dot. You put in this amount of money, give it to the cashier, pay it in cash, and then call me right back. And it's, it's insane because I'm literally just like thinking about a customer that may not know this process and just how scary that it, you know, that it does happen. So just be on the lookout. If you ever feel like there's any suspicious activity like that, give us a call. Our phone number is on the top right of your bill. Um, and chances are, if you feel uncomfortable, it's not good, right? So go through your gut there, but we will never call you um, to ask you for money, as well as that whole thing with us coming to your house. Always ask for identification. We carry badges. Um, we're not trying to get in and go into your backyards and things like that. Most of our team, they know where your meter is. They have access to it. If there's any access issues, we can work with you on, on getting that done. Um, but make sure you ask for identification and make sure that you, um, you know, protect yourselves with that. And thanks for mentioning that earlier. With that, um, I conclude mainly the, our website, anaheim.net slash save, is where you can find a lot of this information that I talked about. Um, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. And uh, I'll be here to the remainder of the event as well. All right, thank you. At least I need one question. I mean, come on. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. Do we have a program for gray water systems? The question is gray water systems. Do you have a program? Um, the answer, this is, I've got to go back a couple years. We were considering doing something like that. I don't believe, as a utility, we have one. Um, I can follow up with you on that, though. I, I don't know. Does anybody else at the city know if we do? I don't, I don't think so, to answer your question, yeah. Right. Yeah. There are some, uh, so the, the, to follow up with that, he had mentioned uh, what gray water is. So it's using water from your washing machine, you know, your clothes washer, and you can divert it to go um, water your plants and things like that. So there is a system that you can, you can have in place in your home um, that you can do that. So. Do we have a, a rebate for uh, solar? Question was rebate for solar panels. Um, currently, we do not. We used to. Um, we rolled those off about four or five years ago. 
Uh, but what we do have is battery storage. So customers that are looking to uh, put energy from their solar, um, save it in a battery, and then use that energy during you know the times that your solar is not operating, we do have that as an option. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Question in the back, and then I think Jason's moving in on me. <laughs> I need some help with that, Jason. Do you have a program for plagues or plants? Plagues and plants study program for pests? Help with plagues and with plants? Plant pests. Oh, pests. Good question. Um, I've not heard of that before. Um, so, no, most of the stuff that we do is around water conservation for, plant, for, for plants and finding plants that are native and things of that nature. So, there are some citrus. I know citrus beetles out there right now that are, you know, causing issues, but uh, we don't have programs around pests for plants. Andrew, do you think uh, tree power may be able to help with that? Or? So tree power is a good resource. Um, you probably can reach out to tree power. Um, I can give you their information, and they can. You can maybe ask them some of those questions to to see how you, that can how they can help um, if you do have those issues at home. They're resourceful. Do we have time, or should we I? Have, we need to get going. All right, I'll catch you. Uh, I'll, I'll stop by. Thank you, everyone. I'm here to provide us information regarding CERT and disaster preparedness program. Is Adrian Abel from Fire and Rescue? <coughs> Good evening. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. It's been a while since we've all met, and uh, we're almost there. So. Uh, We'll get through this uh, real quick here, but not too quick. So, my name is Adrian Abel, and uh, <clears throat> I'm in a fire inspector with the City of Anaheim Fire and Rescue. And uh, I want to talk about a couple of things and some updates with the fire department and some things that you can do to, to help protect yourself uh, against any dis natural disasters. So, first, real quick, a quick update. Can everybody hear me? Okay. It's been a while since I stood up in front of anything. <clears throat> so a real quick update is uh, on July 28th uh, of last year, um, City Council voted to end our contract with uh, Care Ambulance. That is our uh, emergency medical service ambulance provider for the city. And we are going to do that now in-house. And so what that means is that we ended up hiring uh, about 31 uh, ambulance operators, emergency medical technicians, uh, which now work directly for the fire department. So the program uh, will take on some uh, young men and women, a good stepping stone for them into the fire service, which uh, obviously the fire service is a very uh, competitive endeavor. And so this is a good uh, program, a good foot in the door for these young men and women. It helps us kind of weed out some of these people that uh, we know we want to bring on and, and uh, bring on as, as actual firefighter or firefighter paramedics within the department. So um, the, <clears throat> the, first pro the program is starting off in two phases. So right now, um, our, our first phase is to, uh, we have uh, a couple of ambulances on uh, stations one, three, and six. So those ambulances are now in service at this moment. Um, and then their next phase would be to then bring on additional ambulances to cover the other uh, stations throughout the city. Uh, we are currently still in contract with Care Ambulance, so they are still providing services for us, um, and, but we're just now beginning that transition uh, over and, and taking that over from them. Um, obviously, this is a great benefit to us as, as far as cost savings. Um, everything will be coming directly to us. As far as billing is concerned, <coughs> that, uh, none of that will change. Um, so you will still get uh, your paramedic subscription bills will still be the same. Your ambulance um, transport bill will be the same. Eventually, what we would like to do is to end up combining the paramedic subscription program 
which you get in your utility bill, and that would cover both costs, the, the first responder medical services and the actual transportation. So that is one of the end goals of, of the program as well. Um, next, we are celebrating our Fire Prevention Week, and with that, we are promoting Learn the Sounds of Fire Safety, and those sounds are basically making sure that you install smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors within your home. Um, obviously, smoke alarms, back in the past, we asked you to kind of, you know, every time you change your, uh, your, your clocks, we would ask you to change your batteries. That's no longer the case. So the case now is that we are, uh, a lot of the new battery, or a lot of new smoke alarms that are coming on the market now have internal batteries. And so you buy that, the last about seven years, and now that, uh, that, that smoked alarm goes dead, doesn't work, you buy a new one. So instead of just kind of replacing the battery. So, uh, so that's actually a good thing. That's all uh, statewide and throughout the nation as well. Carbon monoxide is another important um, alarm that we also, that is required state uh, mandated as well in your house. So it's a colorless, odorless gas. We, you don't have to have them throughout the house. They're required at least in the common hallways or um, in uh, one upstairs and one downstairs. So if you're in two story home. Um, real quick, we do have a smoke alarm program. If you own a home, condo or townhome or mobile home in Anaheim, you can uh, call our number down here below and I'll be available to give you out that number uh, afterwards. So you can apply for a free smoke alarm uh, and a carbon monoxide while our supplies last. So if, if you meet that category, uh, we can provide you and drop you off a smoke alarm. We used to install them to go out and actually install that, but with, with the whole COVID situation, uh, Right now, we're just kind of dropping them off. So hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll be able to go back and, and do that again. Um, so there's a number there. And next, we want to kind of remind everybody about disaster preparedness to make it, there's a checklist um, to make sure that you uh, keep water and store, store water, uh, food and extra supplies and batteries in case of a disaster emergency. I know that uh, we have very sophisticated emergency response systems throughout the state, but when a major disaster strikes or a major earthquake strikes, you are on your own for a little while. We will not be able to get to everybody and service everybody in a disaster. And so we want people to kind of be able to store supplies uh, and keep supplies. Uh, we do have a checklist. See me afterwards. I can provide you a checklist um, and, and prepare you for that. Also, if you have that old backpack you're not using anymore or a bag that you're not kind of want to throw away, don't throw it away. Maybe you can repurpose it. You can store items in your backpack. Um, keep that in a, in a certain area. Store extra food, extra stuff in there. Um, it's always good to keep that uh, extra supply there and something that you can kind of grab in an emergency where you're not scrambling around to look for things at the last minute. So. In fact, my mother had to call me in a, in a frantic panic the other day because there was a fire, a brush fire by the house. And, and I, you know, she's scrambling around wanting to know what, what to grab. But I just told her just grab a couple of little items and just, just get going. So the conversation didn't really go like that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to calm her down first. So um, right now with that, and keeping that in mind, right now the, the department is offering in our emergency preparedness uh, or emergency management preparedness section uh, within our department, we are uh, hosting a uh, emergency preparedness symposium uh, on October 23rd at our fire training facility at Northnet, uh, 2400 East Orange Wood Avenue, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And we're gonna go over some uh, how to use a fire extinguisher, small kitchen fires, uh, basic first aid, some home, basic home preparedness, how to make a plan, kind of the stuff we just talked about, uh, we just touched upon. So once again, it's just an emergency prepare, uh, preparedness symposium for a brief period of time. We do have a CERT program. You may have heard of CERT. 
Uh, that's a whole different program where you actually get certified. Um, you can become a member of CERT, uh, become a CERT, but, that, but those are uh, very much more intensive classes and those may go on uh, and, and they're, they're different modules. So it takes a lot of time to train those people to get that type of training. <laughs> well, we know, we kind of realize that not everybody has a time to attend CERT so we put together a symposium um, to kind of just give some basic knowledge. You don't have to be a CERT member. You don't have to be part of CERT. If you decide that you want to do that later, that's great. We'll provide you the opportunity to do that. But this is something that we want to get out to the community uh, and just get the real basics of what you might want to need to know during an emergency. And with that as well, uh, we're also uh, putting together what you call uh, a Listos program. So basically, it combines a lot of CERT and uh, our emergency uh, preparedness symposium, which we created in-house. And this is a, actually a, a curriculum that's already out there, but it's in Spanish. So for our Spanish community, uh, uh, we're putting together a, a program. If you're interested, it's an eight-hour training class that's uh, taught in Spanish. So the curriculum is there. We could have put something together ourselves, but this is kind of uh, already tried. It's already put together. Why, why reinvent the wheel? Um, we already have CERT. We have our symposium. And so this program is out there. We wanted to offer it to those in the, in the uh, Spanish-speaking community. And if you have any questions on, on how to get a hold of this, any, any of this information, there's our website, our general phone number, and I will be available afterwards. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. You mentioned um, the ambulance system Well, what what you pay and let me repeat the question. So you're asking if uh, if you paid your paramedic subscription fee, you would not get a charge for the ambulance. Right. What, <clears throat> so correct me if I'm wrong, I, the, the paramedic subscription program pays for the paramedic services that we provide. The fire department provides the paramedic uh, first responder services. So any actual medical care that is given to you is conducted by our, our paramedics. The actual transportation of the patient which was done by Care Ambulance, which is a private provider, um, that would be billed separately to you or, or, or directly to your insurance. Okay. And and, we never use this, but we do have insurance. Right, so, it, it, insurance so it, nothing's going to change as far as that is concerned. It'll be the same system. Eventually, what the, the, what the program is looking to do is that as you pay your paramedic subscription fee, it, it will cover that um, ambulance uh, fee as well. So, but as far as the billing is concerned, it is going to stay the same. Um, so there, there will be some type of either contact with either you directly or your, your, your private insurance company for the transportation services, so. Yes. And you can call our general line as well with the fire department. Um, and if you have any further questions on that, they'd be more than happy to answer that for you. So any other questions for the fire department? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. I want to thank you for your time today. It was wonderful to see you all here interacting and connecting with your city staff. It is my pleasure. I shall now bid you an adjournment, a goodbye, and go out in the world and sin no more. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>